I will need to see that you've made an entry, but I'll, I'll just do this, PM to see that you wrote that day. Now, if you want me to read it, I have, excuse me, a cabinet over here that has a lock on it. I will keep it open during class, and you can leave your diary there if you want me to read it. I will lock this cabinet at the end of every class. Okay? So, you can each come up, one by one, and take your own turn. Whenever you're ready. And they had to know I cared about them 
Um, we started off by um, having snacks and, and, and doing things that sometimes, you know, I was a classroom teacher, and, and sometimes you look at that and you're like, oh, they're just hanging out. But I taught them what peanut butter was. They never had peanut butter before. And, and we had a lesson on peanut butter and celery. And it's really good with celery, and let's try it with some apples. Um, to the point that the cafeteria lady started bringing down the leftovers, you know, after lunch because she wanted them to try new things. And that's where that relationship comes in because I can't sit here and teach them about reading and writing and vocabulary and comprehension and phonics when they don't know what is this little cup of something they're putting on my lunch tray that smells funny. You know, it, it, go, it gets very basic. Um, and then, like I said, the recognition of a need. Um, this was something, thank goodness, that my administration recognized and then that I took upon myself to um, take a step further. This is the problem statement um, for my research. And I'm going to kind of try to, to go a little, I don't want to go too quick, but kind of quick through this process because I know that all of you have had experiences with research yourself. And um, I want to make sure that we get to the last part, which might be something a little bit newer to you. Um, but the problem statement here is, are these beginning level English learners able to learn and retain more vocabulary when they're taught with the native language support component? Um, <clears throat> the first piece was a pretest. Um, they were given a pretest using pictures. Um, I, I created a simple checklist um, with English and Spanish. They looked at the picture. Can you tell me what this picture, what this word is in English? Yes or no? Check or X. Can you tell me what it is in Spanish? Yes or no? Check or X. It was very simple in the beginning. We went through all 40 pictures in the beginning. Um, then for the first week, I taught 20 of those words without native language support. So that means that it was all in English. Okay, the first week I was teaching all in English. I was using picture games. I was using illustrations, um, sentence constructions. Um, we were re diagramming you know, moving words around. Um, we're lucky at Greater Clark to be a one-to-one -one technology initiative district, so they have Chromebooks, so they were able to use technology and word games and things online. So all of these elements were taking place, but in English, okay? Even when they looked at me in tears because they didn't understand and wanted me to tell them, I had to stand firm and tell them I can't tell you right now in Spanish. That was hard. Um, after that first week, we, did, we took a post-test on the first 20 words with the pictures, same format with the checklist um, in Spanish and English. And then the second week, I took the second 20 words. We did the same thing, but naturally, at this point, we're adding that Spanish element, um, you know, that dual language support into the research. And this is where it got interesting to me, because at this point, I was taking those anecdotal notes and those observations that I'm sure you've all learned how important are, and at that point, I didn't realize how important they were going to be to my conclusions until I started noticing what was happening. And naturally, the attitude and the confidence of these students improved because they knew what I was saying. Um, but they began to label their picture cards in English without prompting. So here I am giving them the connections of um, pelota and ball. And they are phonetically, because remember, they can't necessarily spell these words. I'm not writing the words in English for them. This is oral. But they're writing them on the back of their cards in English, which I thought was just fascinating because that didn't happen the week before. And they also are starting to make connections on their own and recognizing the cognates. And when I talk about a cognate, I talk about a word that's the same in English as it is in Spanish. So they were starting to have those internal connections that I was not even intending on teaching them. So to me, this piece was key. And this, at this point, told me, okay, there's going to be a positive, you know, result to this research. So like previously, I did the post-test again with the 20 words, same format with the checklist. Um, and then we took a complete week off. Okay, we had an entire week of not talking about the words. We're doing something completely different. We're not doing anything with the picture cards, you know, you're not playing the games, you're not doing any of that. Um, this was essential for the retention piece um, because after that, in the fourth week, I did another post-test over the same 40 words to see if they, how many they retained and if the retention was different in the week when I taught only in English versus the week I taught in English and Spanish. Once again, the same checklist, same format of the, the test, you know, to keep that um, standard. 
here are the results, and I, I kind of picked and or chose just a few pieces because I could talk about the results for hours, and I don't want to bore you to death. But naturally, um, the words identified with without and with language support is our first graph here, and there was a 23.33 increase in Spanish words. And then there was an 18.66 percentage increase in English. But what I thought was even more interesting is when you get over here to the with native language support, you have a 20% increase in Spanish and a 15% increase in English. Now remember, this is students that don't speak these words in English. And quite frankly, some of the pictures, they didn't even know what they were in Spanish to begin with. So to me, that shows me as an educator that this is valuable and this is essential um, in this environment, you know, with these newcomers whenever possible. Okay, let me check the time here and see how we're doing. Okay, so how can we make this personal? Um, and this is, I'll be honest with you, this is kind of something that just came to me, um, kind of in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was like, oh, this would be wonderful to approach this part of the presentation, this direction. So I came up with the five W's, it's kind of corny, to action research. Um, when you're talking about who, these are pieces to me um, that are really important as far as who you choose to be part of your study. Um, as educators, naturally, you have to be accessible. It has to be students that you can get to on a regular basis that you can um, you know, talk with, teach, um, gives you time to, for those pre-tests and those post-tests. And you also need to have that relationship with them, like I mentioned before, that is essential. Um, and then there needs to be a need. You know, I think that we can probably, as educators, find a need in probably any child. Um, but for me, what made this so powerful was the need became very personal for me. It was something that I believed in and so I really put my heart and my soul into it because it was important for me and for my, my field. When you're talking about what, that also goes into the need. When you find that need, you use that need to then create your study. It needs to be something that's possible. I, you know, Lisa knows that, you know, I think a lot of times we think a lot bigger than what's possible. I could have probably done a six-month study. Didn't have that kind of time. Um, I only was with the kids for 45 minutes a day. It needs to be something that is within your means of, of being done. And then it also needs to be valuable. It needs to be something that you can take back to your administration, to your school district, to your team lead, whoever that person is, and this information is gonna be valuable to serve a purpose. When should we do this? Always. And that's kind of a, a corny you know, answer for you, but the reality of it is, is as teachers, we should be learning and we should be asking those questions and we should be learning things about our students every day. You know, I think we all probably have had experiences where the dynamics of a class, the dynamics of a group change probably multiple times a day, in some cases, based on what happened the day before or what happened at lunch or did the fire alarm go off? You know, there's lots of things and, and dynamics that happen that can change the elements. And so as you know, teachers, we should be learning and researching constantly. Where do we do this? Um, close to home, and when I say close to home, that's where I'm talking about making it personal. Um, when, you're, when you're doing a, a research study, it needs to be something that you believe in but also something that you're passionate about. And, and the field of ESL is something that I am very passionate about, and um, my life has kind of revolved around it without even realizing. So close to home for me is really just feeling it in my heart and believing in it. Um, it needs to be a safe environment. It needs to be an environment where your kids feel safe, where you feel safe, where you're able to do what you need to do in order to get the results that you need to get, and it needs to be unbiased. There doesn't need to be outside indicators that maybe could, could cause an issue. One of the things that um, I was forewarned about is we had a, um, a translator in our building who was also bilingual, obviously, and she came and helped with my group because I had three kids in the beginning that were at completely different levels, and she came and helped, and we did pull-out sessions one-on-one -on -one, um, with these kids. And I was warned because I was said, you know, she can't come and help during the weeks that you're performing this research because she could hinder the results if she were to talk to them in Spanish. 
And that was difficult for me because naturally I liked her being there, right? It was extra help for me. But it was definitely important that she was not present so that the results were accurate. And then also it needs to be a supported environment. And what I mean by that is that you have support by those around you, by the administration, by t other teachers in the building, by parents. You know, I think it's also very important to mention that, of course, I talked with the parents before I did this. And there had to be an understanding that this was going to happen. I talked with the kids. You know, and I said, hey, this is really something I want to do. What do you think? And because I could build the relationship I keep going back to, they were fine with it. I explained it was for a college class, I explained, you know, I was going to write this big paper, and, you know, they were okay with it. They actually kind of got excited to see the graphs, you know, at the end, and, and say, this is you, and you're that color. They kind of got excited about that. And then this is, this is the key, um, the final point is why. Why do we do research as educators? Why do we do research as teachers? And one of the values that was instilled in me during my time here at IUS was that teachers are lifelong learners. And I didn't really realize what that meant at the time, I'll be honest. But as I have grown in the profession and as I have learned more about myself um, as an educator, um, there's so much more that I want to learn about. Um, getting into the field of ESL and recognizing that you know this simple research project could very easily change the lives of these students. Um, kind of a side note, one of the girls who was in this research um, just two weeks ago, remember she came in August and couldn't even read or write in Spanish, couldn't speak any English. She came two weeks ago and read to me a nonfiction bilingual book with tears in her eyes. And she stopped on the third page and she looked at me and she said, I'm reading. <laughs> and I said, yeah, maybe you are. That is why we continue to learn about our students. Because it's those moments that make everything else go away. That make all the ugly, all of the grades, all of the standardized tests, I mean, we can be honest, it makes it all go away because the life of that little girl changed and she recognized it. Um, along with that is the constant change in the field. In any field of education, there's gonna be things that are changing all the time. I think we can all agree that probably no two years, no two days, no two minutes are the same in your classroom or in your work environment. And so that proves that it's essential to continue to learn, to continue to learn. How can I better myself as a teacher? How can I teach this math lesson better next time? It's that constant reflection. And then make a difference. You know, I'm sure, um, you know, most if not all of you got into this field to make a difference in the lives of, of families, of students um, in the field of education. Um, and one of the biggest ways to do that is to research and to learn and then to share what you've learned with other people to inspire them uh, in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>